1,000 years from now, when archaeologists and anthropologists dig, sift, and sort through the rubble of today's nighttime society and cultural activities, what will they find? A thing once referred to as a hotel, a rust-encrusted DJ turntable, a paper ticket in uh, to the theater that tumbles out of a decaying leather wallet, a fully intact COVID mask. Ten centuries from now, what stories or facts about our civilization at night will be told by these artifacts? You mean they used to throw a cloth pillow stuffed with river sand at a board with a hole in it? What did that mean? Today, we're going to look at some of the facts and artifacts of ancient cultures at night so we might better understand what their nighttime civilizations were all about and perhaps better understand ours. Thank you for joining us for 24 Hour Nation's Nights of Yore, a web panel on life after dark in the ancient world. Now, I might add that for some in 24 Hour Nation's nighttime and cultural economy circles, anything before 1990 is ancient. So we will go with that. You may hear references from our panelists. You will hear references from our panelists that go from the Victorian era back to the Stone Age. And speaking of panelists, it is my pleasure to introduce them to you. Each has a more complete bio on the 24hournation.com website. But in brief, Dr. Nancy Gonlan. Nan is a professor of anthropology at Bellevue College in the metro Seattle area. She is an author and member of the Scientific Board for the International Conference on Night Studies. Her areas of specialization are archaeology of the night, which she will explain, ancient Mesoamericans, and nighttime household archaeology, which is fascinating. Dr. April no uh, Nowell, Noel, Noel, I knew I was going to mess that Excellent. up. Dr. <laughs> April Noel, I had that in my brain, and there you go, Dr. April Noel. N April is a Paleolithic, see, I thought better, Paleolithic no, archaeologist and professor of anthropology at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. She is known for her publications on Paleolithic art, Neanderthals, the archaeology of children, and the relationship between science, pop culture, and the media. Dr. Jane Baxter is an associate professor and anthropology department chair at DePaul University in Chicago, one of my favorite cities. She offers classes in prehistoric and historical archaeology and archaeological methods. She has also examined history and artifacts through the lenses of childhood, gender, labor, and identity. This is a whole world I didn't know even existed. My name is Randall White. I am founder of and host of 24 Hour Nation, a non-commercial project that produces free webinars and a podcast series. We also curate news and information for nighttime economy advocates around the world. Now, those watching and listening, this is for you. Here's what you may expect over the next hour. Each panelist will have five minutes or so to speak and or present on an area of their expertise. After each is presented, I'm sure we're, we're going to have some dialogue amongst us and I may have a question or two. Then after all three have presented, I will ask a question of them all to prime the pump for a broader discussion. And then after that, I will triage some of your questions that come in. You're free to drop questions or chat down in the bottom bar. Uh, they may or may not respond to them during the panel, but I certainly will review them and mm, excavate ah, some uh, of their, your questions for, to present to the panelists towards the end of the program. Now, uh, finally, for our audience, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the 24-Hour Nation website and to our YouTube channel within a day and for our panelists, so you know who is in the audience. Our registrants for this web panel include many who watch, who traditionally watch our 24-Hour Nation webinars, government employees who are focused on the nighttime economy and cultural economy, including everybody from the police department to code enforcement in this, this, this universe, nighttime business owners and managers, consultants in the fields of economic development, nighttime economy strategies, urban planning, arts and culture. And there are a few artists who have logged in for this, but I would say that a half of the people who registered for this web panel are new to us and here because of you. 
They are researchers and academics and students and a couple of fanboys. Man, you know who they are. Geographically, the registrations span the globe. Uh, they have come in from Asia through North and South America, deep into Europe. And for the gentleman in Hong Kong who is staying up tomorrow morning to watch us, thank you. So we will begin with Dr. Nancy Gonlin. Nan, thank you for inspiring this particular panel and for helping to organize this panel. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, great. Let's see, slideshow. So Nights of Your Life After Dark in the Ancient World. Randall, thank you so much for the invitation to share our research with your audience. I really appreciate it. I'll talk very, very briefly about the archaeology of the night and the perspective and evidence for it. So archaeology of the night, what is it? It is something that is understudied and under theorized in archaeology, although the three of us panelists have made strides in uh, correcting that situation. I like to think of the archaeology of the night as viewing the archaeological record through a parallax perspective. If you know what a parallax perspective is, it's looking at something from a different angle. And that's what we do with the archaeology of the night. So there's no reason for us to assume that an artifact or a building was used at uh, during the day as opposed to the night or during the night as opposed to the day. We have what is called day centrism in many sciences where day is the default. We talk about daily practices, but here we can look at something and Think about it in terms of, well, how was it used at night? And was it used at night? And what did people do at night? So we look at artifacts, we look at buildings and art, we look at ancient scripts, history, and also ethnography. All of this informs us about the archeology span of the night. Let's see, um, there we go. So the late classic Mayas, my area of specialization, is a good case study to illustrate the archeology span of the night. I'm talking about a time period from about 650 to 900 of the common era. And if you look at the map, <clears throat> the light green area <clears throat> is the area of the Maya people today and in the past. Today, there are at least 7 million Maya people. And it includes parts of Mexico, like the Yucatan Peninsula and Chiapas, and also the modern countries of Belize and Guatemala, parts of Honduras and El Salvador. So that is the case study that I will be using. And I'd like to, you to look at this image. It's a rollout scene of a pottery vessel that was painted in 778. And this is a cylindrical vessel, but if you roll it out, it looks like this. And this is a great illustration of palace politicking. Now we know who these actors are on the rollout vessel. Here you have the ruler sitting on his bench or throne, Kenich Lama Ek of the Ik Kingdom of Guatemala, receives tribute from his lords with retainers in attendance. And in classic Maya iconography, Torches and smoking are cues for the night. There's a lot going on in this photo. We know that it takes place at night because the use of torches is necessary. And if you look at the attendant holding the torch in the <clears throat> eyes of the Lord sitting on the floor, this is so that the king can read their expressions. Whereas the attendant holding the torch behind the king, he's backlit and this attendant is smoking tobacco. There were nocturnal rituals that were very common for people on all levels of society. Here we have a royal ritual that is portrayed on a lintel 24 from the city of Yachilan in Mexico. And the date is October 28th, 709 of the common era. Here we have Lady Kabul Shuk. She's kneeling and she's honoring her ancestors through bloodletting. 
do not try this at home. This is a thorn line rope that she's dragging through her tongue to make it bleed so that the blood can be caught on this basket full of paper below. And then this is burned in honor of her ancestors. Her husband, King Itzamna Balam, wields a heavy torch to illuminate the darkness. So this was either at night or in a dark temple, hence the need for the torch. There were nighttime battles that occurred in classic Maya society. For example, in the city of Bonampak, Mexico, this uh, mural was painted in a building that sits on the Acropolis, and it dates to 791 of the Common Era. Here you have King Yasa Chan Muan leading the charge against his enemies. And fire was weaponized and utilized in nocturnal battles. It was very common to burn the temples of your enemies, for example. So between this mural and the lintel and the rollout vessel, these are all nighttime activities that we know happen for royal people. But many of the soldiers would have been commoners, for example. And we know that bloodletting occurred for royal people and commoners across the Maya social spectrum. Astronomy is best done at night, today, and in the past. There are a number of observatories that the classic Maya people built. This particular one is at the Maya site of Palenque in Chiapas, Mexico. And you can see it's a few stories high. It would be ideal for looking out over the horizon and looking at uh, tracking the planets. The classic Maya were excellent trackers of the planet Venus. They had lunar calendars, they had solar calendars. They had actually quite a sophisticated knowledge of astronomy. So what were classic Maya people doing at night and who was up at night? Men and women and children were, especially during the harvest period when all hands would be necessary. Astronomers <clears throat> were stargazing. Priests and priestesses were conducting rituals. There were curers and rulers and servants, entertainers, soldiers and merchants, potters, farmers, fishers, and hunters. So a lot of people were up at night doing a lot of things. And that's one of the most surprising things that I found when I started investigating the archeology span of the night is how many people were up and what they were doing. However, having said that, most people were sleeping and hopefully they had a good night's sleep. In elite households, you might find very nicely constructed stone benches for sleeping. I have sleeping benches in quotes here because during the daytime, this kind of feature would have been used for work or for socializing. And you can see that um, they're, they're pretty hard. They're covered with plaster, but nonetheless, they would have been made much softer and more comfortable with matting from palms or cotton and cotton blankets. It does get cool in the tropics. And in houses that were not so well constructed, you might have benches made from perishable materials like adobe, for example, or sleeping mats. Um, a sleeping mat has actually been found at a site, Hoya de Seren in El Salvador, that was covered by volcanic ash. So this clay brazier here was used in these rooms. You can see the burn marks on the floors and this would have been used to heat up the night. It does get cool in the tropics, as I said, and it could also be used to warm up um, anything that you want to heat up there, an old tortilla for a snack, for example, and it would also scare away the uh, bugs. Light is apotropaic, meaning that it has properties to scare away danger, whether the danger is real or imagined. So that's nighttime household archaeology is looking inside the house to see what we find. So modern nighttime household archaeology. What is it in your household that relates to the night? Think about the artifacts that you have and the spaces that you use at night or how a material object is transformed as the sun sets. 
So you can do a nighttime household archaeology in your own house. Think of nightgowns and nightstands and the bed. So these are a few books that relate directly to the archaeology of the night. The first one, April and I co-edited, and Jane has a chapter in there. And this book has been translated into Mandarin. And the second volume, Night and Darkness in Ancient Mesoamerica, co-edited by myself and David Reed. And then After Dark, The Nocturnal Urban Landscape and Lightscape of Ancient Cities, co-edited with Megan Strong, who is an Egyptologist. So that is my presentation, and I want to thank you for your time. I'm sure I ran way over five minutes. I'm a professor. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> I understand fully. We will, and we will, uh, we will keep, uh, we will keep within a kind of a ten minute total section here with a few discussion questions. There is one question that asked a gentleman by the name of Roger Chambers asks in respect to the Maya rollout that you presented, Nan. He's interested to know how do we know the names of the people. These glyphs, and I'm not an epigrapher, so I do not read hieroglyphs, but I would say that 90% of Mayan hieroglyphs are deciphered, and I rely on experts who do that to inform me about what this particular, uh, what these particular glyphs say. It's very common for the Maya to include the date on something, so any kind of fancy pottery vessel like this is going to have a date on it, not your run-of-the-mill cooking pot, for example, but something really fancy like this. Okay. And then um, one other question I had, and, and then maybe uh, we can queue up uh, uh, April for her section next. How do we know um, the... I mean, it seems to me like there's a... Um, I love the conversation pit, basically, <laughs> and that, that with the with the sleeping bench, and then the fact that there was a stove. There's like uh, that that is very common to what we have today. We have little conversation areas with a place to keep us warm at night. So I'm always looking for the connections between then and now. How would you connect the then and now of that battle, the nighttime battles? The nighttime battle. It is common for many. Um, people around the world to have nighttime battles, which is why the army developed their night vision goggles mm. so that they could see better at night uh, for the U.S. Army. Right. So there's a direct connection. The ancient Romans like to attack at night, for example. Under cover of night. Mm. Yes. All right. All right. That's that's terrific. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I see. Well, and someone else asks, hi, I was wondering just how do we know, and I'll this be my last question to you, Nan, before I move on. <laughs> how do we know it is happening at night, that the lights just aren't there because it's indoor and it's dark? But you mentioned that specifically, how we know it's night in these uh, drawings and the illustrations, right? Right. Um, if you have a torch, if you have a light, you're more likely to use that at night than not. And across the ancient world, there are all different kinds of lights that were invented. I believe, April, you might uh, say a few words about that. Is that not true? Yes. Yeah. So that is a cue for the night whenever you have lighting. Think about when you use lights in your own house. Right. When do you turn them on? You turn them on at night. So when there's an illustration or a drawing or um, uh, um, uh, petroglyphs that, in, that maybe or that show a torch, or something being lit that's an indicative of that was a nighttime snapshot. Could be, okay. but you should not assume that it's only during the day. Okay, okay. All right, okay. I get it. Okay. It's April. a parallax perspective, looking at things from day and night. Oh, I see. Perfect. Perfect, which I think we must do all the time. Uh, yes, we do. Dr. Dr. Noel, April, let's see. Uh, let's hear from you now. I'm Are very we? curious. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, share my slides as well. Okay, from the beginning. Oops, okay, can everyone see my slides too? We can. Okay. Excellent. It's always my, <laughs> always my worry. Okay, um, so thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, it's it's a, a really a pleasure. And, uh, and I'll say thanks to Nan also for uh, getting me involved in this uh, project on the archaeology of night to begin with. Um, so 
Today, our experience of the night sky differs dramatically than what our ancestors would have experienced. Uh, before they mastered fire, our ancestors would have spent roughly half their lives in darkness. So after sunset, the only light that they would have had would have been from the, the moon uh, if it was a clear night. Um, but other, so it wasn't until we learned to make and control the use of fire on a regular basis, say around 400,000, 500,000 years ago, that everything uh, changed. And after that point, uh, we had some source of artificial light. Uh, as Nan mentioned, uh, stone lamps, for example, but maybe, you know, we're more familiar perhaps when we're thinking about the Stone Age of campfires, but they also had torches. And as I say, stone lamps, like the one I have uh, pictured here from the very famous site of Lascaux in, in France. And once we started to extend these daylight hours, we also started to change our circadian rhythms or what we refer to as our biological clock. And when we talk about a biological clock, what we're really talking about is uh, a 24 hour cycle that relies primarily on the hormone melatonin to convert these external light cues uh, into biological rhythms. And that's why a lot of us take melatonin, for example, when we're traveling, because we want to sort of mitigate the worst effects of, of jet lag. And so all these rhythms really underlie our very species specific um, uh, changes in, in activity, uh, growth and reproduction and so on. Um, but sitting around a campfire also really changed our sleep patterns. And that to me was something really interesting as I started to do this research. So compared to uh, other, compared to non-human primates, so compared to other primates like chimpanzees and gorillas, humans sleep less, but we sleep much more intensely. And significantly, uh, there's a higher proportion of our total sleep time that's taken up by what we call REM sleep. And, you know, more so than you would think for a primate of our size and so on. But during non-REM sleep, uh, that's when our body temperature lowers, our breathing slows, and our body just redirects all of its energy to repair, or a lot of its energy to repairing bone and other tissue. Um, but by contrast, during REM sleep, that's when our brain is, is much more active and it causes us to experience these, you know, intense and vivid dreams. And most importantly, the parts of our brain um, that are related to memory and learning and rehearsing stressful events, kind of sequencing or thinking through things, those parts of our brain um, are stimulated. And it actually tells us then what we learned from this is that there was throughout our evolution, a real importance placed on skill sets uh, that involved imagination and planning and being able to think through the consequences of a situation before um, before doing something. You know, do I really want to do this? <laughs> thinking it through? Do I really want to do this or not? That's that's an act, you know, that's an important skill. And of course, being able to innovate and adapt to novel situations. Um, and all of these things are key to our success as a species. So what we see is that if you look at the total uh, sleep time, the amount that we, we've lost in comparison to other primates uh, can be accounted for by a three hour reduction in non-REM sleep. So even though that's important for repairing our body, we've decided, you know, put that in quotes, we've decided we've selected for these, these other abilities. And why would that be? Uh, well, Polly Wiesner is uh, a cultural anthropologist, and she did this phenomenal study in 2014, where she looked at the kinds of things that foragers or, or people that we might call hunter-gatherers um, uh, talk about during the day versus at night. And during the day, she found that people talked, you know, like, 
like they gossiped and they talked about economic stuff and, and those sorts of things. But at nighttime, you know, this night talk uh, was really involved with people coming together, often around a campfire uh, and, and telling stories uh, primarily as a way to teach the next generation. Um, and they would also engage in dance and in music and so on. And so what Wiesner has, has argued is that when early humans were able to master fire, it wasn't that they were just, you know, adding extra daylight hours. It wasn't just more of the same, but she argued that artificially produced light actually opened up this new and distinct place for early humans to inhabit. So this place where imagination and storytelling and, and, and coming together, this this galvanizing of people, this this bringing together of people uh, could take place. And so what we can see that that from then on, uh, things just increased exponentially, that the night became a busy place uh, ever since that point, but even in uh, even in the Stone Age, even in the Paleolithic. Oops, I think you're there. Yeah, we go. there we go. I hit the wrong button. I opened a, <laughs> I opened a window. That's, I have to come back. That's fascinating because <laughs> we want to think that in the Ice Age, we begin to have these socialized periods around with other people where we dance and sing. It sounds like we're going to the club. And it also <laughs> means it, it also means that this was a creative time. And uh, I think in, in our times today, folks, many folks get creative or contemplative at night. And and it seemed that the, the artificial light, I'm very intrigued by the sleep uh, references you had in the shift in our mm -hmm. RAM. And uh, um, here is some, here's a question I've got. Thank you, Roger Chambers, for asking another question. I'm always fascinated in how we know things about animals more than what we know. So how do we know that human sleep is more deep than that of other primates? Uh, well, there are people who actually specialize in studying sleep patterns, and so they, you know, monitor the brain and and the brain's activities, what parts of the brain are being stimulated, uh, for how long, and so on. And they do these comparisons between uh, humans and other primates, so chimps, gorillas, orangs, and so on. Um, and so they're able to document those differences uh, quite specifically, actually. And coincidentally, this happens to be Jane Goodall's 90th birthday. Did I read that somewhere today? Oh, so is that right? Oh, uh, so speaking of people who study <laughs> primates. So uh, uh, another question of you, April. Uh, what about fragmented sleep? Somebody asks. For those who are, is that a new thing? No, um, actually, there are two things I want to say about that. So the the first thing um, is that we, so even though our our circadian rhythms are quite um, species specific and so on, there is a cultural component to sleep. So we all tend to think that the getting eight hours or what you know that is this you know that we always hear from magazines or whatever is what we're supposed to do and it's the normal natural sort of thing. But we know that at different times and different places there have what's considered normal has been quite different so for example uh, from what we what we do now so for example the romans had uh two main blocks of sleep they would they would have an uh you know a first sleep and then they would get up in what we would consider the middle of the night and they would write or have you know have sex or make food or do you know any the other things that you might do and then they would have a second sleep and the duration and the timing of the sleep of the onset and and termination of these different you know when it started and stopped is what I'm trying to say uh you know would change uh, throughout the year depending on how long the you know how long day, days were so where you were in the in the calendar um and and so and that was normal so what we so there is both this biological part to our sleep as well as as a cultural component to it um, and the other thing I would would just say really quickly is that when we're talking about connections to the modern day, uh, in fact, there's a lot of research looking at this um, 
uh, change to the, you know, how we're lighting up the night sky and everything and light pollution and so on, and its impact on health. And you may have covered this in previous seminars, but we know that there are different kinds of cancers, for example, that are related to these disruptions in our sleep. There's all sorts of, of, of health and social consequences of having interrupted um, sleep, fragmented sleep. So yeah, and I, as, as Nan has pointed out to me earlier in the email, this is also the International Dark Sky Week. Is that correct? Absolutely. And then next yeah. week where I live, I'm going to have a full eclipse. So I can't imagine what people of your thought when suddenly in the middle of the day, things went black. Do you have any information about that? Um, the, I don't study that in particular, but I know that there are um, archaeoastronomers uh, who actually do a lot of work on that. And, and maybe Jane or Nan, you'd know more about this, but uh, we certainly have a chapter in our first book um, about that specifically. Okay. And, and people in the past, you know, designed their buildings around, you know, the they were certainly aware of of of, um, of equinoxes and those sorts of things. So they would have been aware of the rare occasion of, of eclipses and would have, you know, responded to that for sure. Okay. Well, thank you. And we'll, we'll segue now to Jane. Dr. Baxter, speaking of light, uh, I think our conversation is going to go here. I read some of this information and was completely enthralled. So we'll uh, we'll go to your presentation now. Thank All you. right. I'll get my screen up. We can see that all, I hope, for everybody. We can. Yeah. Um, and I am going to, if you are of a certain age on the left here, we can all rock on down to Electric Avenue and we can take it higher. Uh, that was, if that's your thing, <laughs> there it is. So um, I study the 19th century, so I could not be more removed in time um, from what we just heard from April. Um, but, and, and I actually work in a time when, we started this practice of lighting the night in ways that have caused this light pollution that we now are trying to combat and that result in things like dark sky week and the celebration of dark skies. Um, and I just included a couple of images. Um, on the right is uh, an early image of when uh, towns were gaslit, and this did not produce the same kind of effusive light. They did improve mantle technology regularly over time as a way of increasing the light output. But it's not until like over here on the left where you have electrified streets that you start to have uh, the ability to extend all kinds of daytimes in all kinds of ways. If you think about it in 19th century terms, it allows an increase in mechanization. Three shift factory work is only made possible because you can light the night. The movement of vehicles, um, <clears throat> again, is, is really a light-driven thing. And Electric Avenue is a, a place that exists in South London in Brixton. And until the 1980s, and it breaks my heart, I never got there, the original light fixtures were on the street. You could actually go see Electric Avenue, um, hence its fame. But I'm going to talk about the work um, that I do um, and that I wrote about in the volume on the Bahamas, which is... Um, uh, and this center photo is not mine. You can Google it and take it right off the internet. Somehow reconfiguring the slide took the citation off and I apologize to whoever's this is, but the Bahamas is a dark sky refuge. Um, and you can see skies like this quite regularly um, when you were in the Bahamas. So while in the 19th century, and in fact, the late 18th century, um, England brought colonists to the Bahamas, they didn't bring light. So, um, I just want to give you a, a quick sense of sort of where we are. I'm actually talking to you from right about here, <laughs> right now on in Florida. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the island of San Salvador, which is the easternmost of the Bahamian Islands. So it's next stop Africa if you head east. And it is indeed a very dark sky refuge. Um, and I wanted to just give you a little bit of context um, in saying that the Bahamas um, was a very late colonial enterprise in the Caribbean. It was colonized after the American Revolution, and it was a solution for the British who had all these loyalists who were now being persecuted as outsiders in a new country. Um, and they first, many of them went to Canada as refugees. Others went to Florida. When Florida was annexed in 1783 to, by Spain, they had to put all these people somewhere. And the Bahamas, they sold them these plantations. These are inexperienced planters. They purchase 
uh, people and supplies and move them to these islands. And they are an economic failure um, because there is no quality conditions to grow anything effectively in the Bahamas. So the thing to think about is that while these plantations are established around 1790, they're abandoned by 1810. Um, and the enslaved peoples are left there as enslaved people until emancipation in 1834 with usually actually an enslaved person as an overseer. So I wanna just give that as context for what I wanna talk about, which is how they were using nighttime. And I think the Bahamas is a really cool example because, and, and when I got the chance to write about this, I was thrilled because for those of you who don't know about uh, contemporary Bahamian celebrations, Junkanoo, is an ongoing celebration. You can still go uh, and participate in Junkanoo. And it begins at 1201 on Boxing Day and 1201 on New Year's Day. And it is a massive parade and celebration that takes place at night. Um, and these pictures that I've shown are showing you here, you can see the modern ones are at night. Um, and I wanted to show you the, the bottom ones. This is actually when British colonial officials said you can't do this at night. It's too subversive. Um, and we're going to make you do it in the daytime. But it does give you a sense of these deep historical origins. People who have studied Junkanoo um, tell us that um, it goes all the way back to this period of enslavement. And it went back to historically to Christmas um, when slave owners would give people time off. They believed that they should have time off for the Christmas holidays. And they used it by going into the woods, into the bush, as they call it in the Bahamas, um, at night and developing community and creating new traditions in a new context. This is a highly fragmented population. Some people directly from Africa, some creolized from or throughout the Caribbean, some being brought from uh, the American colonies, and they're creating a new identity. And I choose these lower images because you can see they're transforming themselves along uh, the lines of many traditional African practices of putting on masks and disguising your appearance and transforming yourself. And the ones on the bottom, you can see they're using local materials. So remarkably, especially um, this one here, you can see they have sort of leaves um, and natural limestone derived paint, but these are people dressed completely in sponges they've foraged from the Caribbean Sea and decorated their bodies. So we have lots of examples of these. It later turns into paper, and now it's a very elaborate uh, costume making. But one of the unique things about Junkanoo uh, costumes is they're all made from paper and feathers and things that can be destroyed. So you wear your costume once, you leave it outside in the rain and let it dissolve back into nature in homage of this deep historical tradition. This is so deeply meaningful to Bahamians, a Bahamian identity. Um, a very famous Bahamian, Stan Birdside said, Bahamians were never slaves because they had Junkanoo. That's how important it is in their cultural sense of identity and this sense of deep historical relationships to their ancestors. So um, when I was studying plantations, I did archeology span for several years in San Salvador. Um, and these are uh, the map here on the far right. Um, I excavated some of these plantations and then used collections, extant collections from some other ones. And um, when this project came up, I was so enticed by the idea of thinking about my archaeological sites at nighttime. I decided, you know, oh gosh, I know all these little fragments. What if I put it together? And so this one very succinct slide is sort of means, motive, opportunity, and so what? So one of the things that we would find quite often on archaeological um surveys around the island, and you can see it here, they look like Molotov cocktails, but they're not. They're actually slow burning kerosene lanterns that Bahamians still use when they go out crabbing. So land crabs have a season. It's a highly competitive foraging act. Nobody tells anybody their secret crabbing locations, and they go into the bush using this light, using materials that would have been available all the way back into the 18th century. Um, and the glow of this particular light is not as disruptive to the crabs. So you can 
kind of hide it back and then stun the crab with this sort of bright flash of light. But also other people have a hard time tracking your movements. So you can keep all of your movements secret. Um, so you can keep the best crabs to yourself for your family. And this is a picture of crab foraging on San Salvador. You can see how dark it is. And other than the camera flash, the only light is these very low burning kerosene lamps. People do not use flashlights for this. So these are technologies that when you talk to people, they say, oh, my great grandparents use this and their parents use this. I mean, it's a deep sense of this is a technology that goes back for generations. A question of motive of why would people be trying to do this or, or trying to move around at night is that even under um, a period of overseers, um, and certainly during a period of sharecropping, daytime wasn't really feasible for motion. You were constrained in all kinds of ways. You can see the scale of this, the size of the island, uh, about five miles across, about 15 miles long, with some waterways that allow some movement. Um, but it was probably to create community. And we have evidence of community being created. And I'll give you sort of an example here in the bottom. You can see um, just three different pattern ceramics. And when people purchase ceramics for plantations, they, they, they buy things that match, right? Like you don't want not matchy-matchy dinner plates. We don't buy mismatched sets now unless it's a very specific trend or something. Um, yet at archaeological sites, we find these mixed in different proportions, suggesting you can figure out which plantation a particular pattern was originally purchased for, but you see little bits and fragments showing up at other sites. And often um, we know from other studies of enslaved communities all over the southeastern United States, it was very common to bring broken pieces of things, little tokens, to symbolize relationships that you had with people in other places that you couldn't always have access to. And we can see this happening on these plantations. We also, from the period probably after 1810 and between 1810 and 1834, have um, artwork that's being created on former planter residences that suggests there's an element of storytelling and art being made um, in ways that wouldn't have been allowed during the day, even though um, it would have been a little too transgressive. So if an image shows up in the morning, there's not a lot you can do because you don't know who made it, but nobody could see you sitting there making it. It's very clear these things are going on as a way of connecting people. Um, and in terms of opportunity, I did a really cool study with my students where we actually tested soundscapes of plantations and looked at acoustics to see if people would be able to move undetected. Um, so we did this by having people with walkie talkies in where the planter and overseer residences would be and then in the enslaved people's residential areas which were separated at varying places um, from a half to a full football field roughly as a way of thinking about it. And we would do sound tests under different conditions to say could people actually leave undetected at nighttime. Um, or any time? And the answer was clearly yes. So we we sort of, well, you can't say anything is definitively happening at night. We have no written records um, from these plantations. The means, motive, and opportunity are clearly there. And I think the other big question, and I'm trying to keep this really quick, but is so what? And I kind of came to two conclusions, <laughs> one of which is that we always study plantations as plantations, like this is an important economic driving unit. It's what's organized historically. I've included the image of a slave register, and that's what it is. Here's the name of the plantation. Here's everyone who lives here. But I don't necessarily know if, you know, given the fact we know that they had means, motive, and opportunity to be interacting, that the best way to actually think about the lives of these enslaved people um, and people living uh, before emancipation and after emancipation is as these economic units, because there's clearly a lot of exchange going on um, in ways that are clandestine and 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 um, after after the sort of traditional work of the plantation day is done. The other thing I think is important is so often when people write about things like enslavement and nighttime, it brings up narratives of things like the Underground Railroad or going out and doing, you know, so resistance. The main word you often hear is resistance. And I think there's nothing wrong with the idea of is resistance but it also is still in reference to the people you're resisting. And I think what Junkanoo shows us is that it's not just a matter of resistance, that nighttime provided people with a deep time of cultural creation 
of the development of new identities that were independent of anything that had preexisted in their own lives before. And I think that we should think more about the opportunities that nighttime afforded enslaved peoples to fully be human, to fully embrace and create their own humanity. So um, that's sort of my, my big takeaways of why I thought this was a really important way of rethinking my archeological research. And I look forward to um, some more conversations. So oh I my goodness. So I'm, I'm completely enthralled by this. Thank you, Jane. How sure. much influence did Junkanoo have on Mardi Gras or the, um, what's the parade in Philadelphia? Um, well, the there bummers. are a lot there. Yep. And there are a lot of carnival celebrations that happen. Um, if you, it depends that there were, there was also a place or there was also junk in you in North Carolina for a very yeah. brief period of time as outlawed and, and went defunct, but there are records of it in the 19th century. Um, it's a different time of year. So okay, Mardi right, Gras, right, Carnival, yeah. all those things are associated with Lent. And they were things that were taking place largely um, when people have compared this um, with some different forms of consent and cultural concession in terms okay. of participation. Junkanoo is considered so important uh, by Bahamians because it was something they created all on their own. Um, it was something they did uh, they were given this opportunity and it was how this time was taken advantage of and used and um, it, they're incredibly proud of Junkanoo as something that um, was created as an act of cultural creation. You know, you have this archipelago of 700 islands and people are isolated on all of these islands and there is occasional trade ships moving with crews of in other enslaved people. So they are having contact too. And, but somehow they come out of this as a sense of being one people. And I think it, they owe a lot of that, or they credit a lot of that to Junkanoo. And it is still a year round uh, cultural process in the Bahamas um, of, of working and building your costumes and planning. Um, you know, it's changed a lot, but they are very aware of the roots of the celebration. And I think it's a ex exciting nighttime event. Someone, um, um, Natalie Butcher asks, what does Junkanoo mean? Does it have a, a translation? It No, I mean, I, they're not sure. Some people, um, there is a historical newspaper reference, but this is written by British colonists. So, so take it for what it's worth. So what yeah. do they know exactly? Where they <laughs> refer to them as the Johnny Canoes. So it's a name where they say Johnny Canoe. Um, and some people think that, that's sort of how it got its particular sound. Um, but it nobody's exactly sure where Duncan okay. comes from. Well, and yeah. speaking of sound, and, and then I'm going to ask this of all three of you. Uh, Jane talked uh, a bit about sound at night. We often think of artifacts as being tangible things you can hold in you or you can see. But there are, aren't there other artifacts that have to do with the other senses that you are able to kind of log or reference or dig out of, uh, of, of, of history, things that we touch or things that we hear or things that we can even taste? What role does that play in your work? I'm sure in Mesoamerica, there must be some reference to the spices or chocolate, cacao, right? Chocolate is a drink that was typically taken at night. And I'm all for that. <laughs> they would uh, ferment the chocolate. They, meaning ancient Mesoamericans, would ferment chocolate. And we do find pottery vessels that contain the remains of chocolate. The theobromine is the essential chemical signature of chocolate. So that is one thing that you can connect to the night. There's a scene at Piedras Negras, a carved panel that shows a feast occurring with the king and he has his former enemies from Yashilan come over. And the inscription says that they enjoyed a hot inebriating chocolate drink and danced at midnight. So in the Bonampak murals, I showed you only the scene where there's a battle, but it's actually three rooms full of murals. And one of those rooms shows, excuse me, a line of musicians with trumpets and drums and rattles. And in very extraordinary circumstances, those kinds of materials can be preserved. 
So this falls under sensory archaeology. Okay. And there are many archaeologists who study the senses in the past and archaeological evidence for those senses. Okay. And April, I recall one stone that mm -hmm. uh, showed a woman with a, they, they think it's a rasp. Is that something yes. that's tell us about from the sensory experience that, that from your knowledge and your research in the ice age uh, those yeah, stone absolutely so we have um a lot of evidence for musical traditions in in the stone age which you know you wouldn't really think about normally probably the earliest music is just people you know playing uh either singing or using their bodies to to drum on and so on or they might be using gourds or other um items that, you know, wouldn't preserve, but we do actually have evidence of flutes going back at least 40, 43,000 years ago. They're made out of mammoth ivory and they're made out of um, like bird bones, vulture bones and so on, because uh, they're hollow. So they're, they're perfect for flutes. Um, and we have, you know, evidence that people are using uh, the caves themselves as sort of lithophones. So uh, nice. we have uh, percussion marks on them. And and, and we have, um, uh, especially where the acoustics are, are really, really good. So we have all of these sorts of things in sometimes in isolation, but also in conjunction with some of the cave art. And one of the, la the last slide that I showed, and I wasn't sure how much time I had, so I didn't um, go into the image there. Um, can I can I show you that last sure, slide? Sure, really bring quickly. it back up, bring it back yeah, up. Yeah, let me just do it super fast if I can find uh find it there we go um can you uh can yeah. you see that slide whoops where did I it did. disappear <laughs> there, it is there we go <laughs> and so you can see this multi-legged bison and right. so when we're talking about sensory archaeology um some of the images in these caves uh, they're of animals that have multiple legs or multiple tails or three heads. And you would think like, is this some kind of fantastical creature or something? Uh, but what we think actually is that it's people playing with light, that it's what we might call an early uh, prehistoric cinema. So that when you go into these caves and you hold your torch or your lamp in just the right way, some of these, the and then you flicker it because you can imagine the flickering flame. It brings some of these limbs into, it, uh, makes some of the limbs more visible than others. And so it gives you the sense of, of motion. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about senses, uh, you can have the music, the acoustic of the caves, the 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 dripping of, of water in them and the un, uneven terrain and, and all of those sorts of things that you're hearing and feeling and, and uh, seeing in, in conjunction with, you know, these sorts of images that are moving and projecting from the cave walls. And I think that they were these visual components of storytelling so that, um, you know, in one of the things that, you know, Jane also said was so important for cultural continuity between the generations, for bringing people together, I think has such a great antiquity. And we can see, you know, here um, in the cave art that this is this is happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, the one last thing I would say about that is that it's kind of fun because we tend to think about Ice Age peoples as being only worried about their next meal, you mm -hmm. know, that they don't have time for anything like that. But we actually see that there's a lot of playfulness in in their art. And I think that kind of humanizes them. For, well, for and I think also with the multi-legged bison, it looks like a lot of the artificial intelligence illustrations I see now with people that have two arms in oh, the wrong yeah. place. It, 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 that creeps uh, me out. I, I'm yeah, it so does kind of freak me out too. Just last, here's a question that, that's come in and this is for you, Jane. Uh, a, a general question. Uh, how do you comment on the extension of the street lamp system in any time period. I, there was that time I remember reading about when the, uh, the gas light was replaced by electric, electric light and how suddenly it really did change community. It changed community, moved people to the night. And uh, as, a, as a people master of the night, this, this, as people mastered the night, government governs more. Uh, do you have a sense of, of how that was managed? Uh, well, I mean, I think that one of the things we can think of is when we think of streetlights, we think of 
more urbanized settlements, right? Mm -hmm. And so urban settlements are hardly confined to the modern world or recent times. I mean, we have cities and urban settlements that go back in time. And I think that we can think of many reasons uh, that lighting uh, would have had a connection to some kind of central organization, right? Sometimes that could be commercial, could be private, could be government. One of them is to put together a street lamp system, whether somebody's manually lighting it or you have to flip a switch, requires a kind of infrastructure that no one citizen or small group of citizens is going to be able to put together alone. So some overarching entity has to coordinate that effort on behalf of everybody who's interested in having illuminated streets. So there's the simple and then maintain it, right? Okay. So that is one uh, essential way that we can think about some larger scale entity engaging with this practice of lighting. And we can think of some of the things that it certainly does do. It allows for in urban populations, um, safety and surveillance, right? Depending on how, what side you wanna be on that, but it allows you to see better. As a woman, I am very grateful for a really good street light system. Often when I have to walk from point A to point B after dark, I think many people feel that way, right? It's It gives a sense in a large population where there's a lot of people you don't know, which is very different than being in a cave with a candle with some people you know, <laughs> you know, like a sense that you can see mm -hmm. and size up and feel safe. And I think that's important. But it also, I think we should think about the commercial drivers of this, right? The longer you can leave a business open, Black Friday would not be possible unless we could light things up sort of, you know, right after Thanksgiving dinner, people can rush out to stores or, or 24 hour stores, which is a huge thing, or even the movement of goods and supply chains now rely on that. And as much as government and commercial enterprises are entwined, uh, these are essential systems we've come to absolutely rely on. So I think there's lots of dimensions to that. But one thing you can think of is anything as coordinated as a major urban or national light system requires somebody to be in charge right, or it's not right. going to Right. right. And, uh, and I, somebody writes, it allowed for longer working hours, too, which uh, we could weigh yeah. both sides of that. But and we are at a time in the nighttime economy, nightlife economy and nightlife culture right now, huge debates in cities around the world about extending hours. We're still talking about that. Well, we can't extend hours. That means this. That will happen. And, and some of that subversiveness of the night that's a hangover from what you were talking about in the Bahamas, Jane, that 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 that. Mm. Things, not good things happen at night. We're still afraid of the dark as a culture and we assign so much negative to it when the, you all have told me there's so much beauty to it and there's so much deepness to it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very um, pleased this is we're nearing the end of our hour. And this is like a, this is like a small little, this is like tiny plate meal. <laughs> and I wanted to have a whole banquet with you all. So uh, there's more questions coming in. I, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to them. But I do want to summarize like this. History is based on facts. Artifacts are evidence. The science of archaeology frames both the present and the future. And educators and researchers like our guests today deserve high regard from society, higher than they're getting. We need to listen to the past to maintain our humanity with one another, especially at night. I thank you, doctors, Gonlin, Baxter, Noel, for joining. I appreciate your time so much for this little appetizer. For those watching and listening live or streaming later, thank you for joining. Uh, you can check out our panelists' bios, and I've got links to their books at 24hournation.com, as well as uh, their other publications and their universities. You can check out if you want to go on a career course down the uh, anthropology or archaeology way. There you go. Uh, and before you leave us, one big announcement. 24 Hour Nation presents its next free and live one-hour webinar in the headlights. Thursday, April 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern. All data tells us, we're going to go back to topical information for this one. All data tells us that pedestrian deaths at night are at an alarming rise, particularly in the United States. With this panel, we plan to elevate the conversation about those who navigate our cities at night by foot, bike, or wheelchair. 
My panelists will be Nick Mesler. He's a tra uh, transportation planning and traffic engineer, director with EV, uh, Ivari GIS. Ivari is a has a remarkable software platform that reveals important data about vehicular-based pedestrian deaths and harm in our cities at night. Nick will be joined by Kia Wilson. Kia is a senior editor for Streets Blog USA. Uh, our urban planners know all about Streets Blog. It's a very respected daily news site that covers mm -hmm. the American movement away from car culture. I know Martin Murray in the UK is not going to be happy about hearing that. Perhaps in doing so, the United States might better mirror some of what we're seeing in European cities in our how we get around. And speaking of European cities, I'm very excited that the third panelist will be Chiara Molinar. She's chief of pedestrian policy and responsible for ensuring hospitable public environments for those who walk, bike, and roll in Paris. May we? Anyway, <laughs> so if there's one place that everybody's looking to right now for the transformation into a more pedestrian urban space. It's Paris, and I'm glad we're going to have a key architect of that with us. You'll be able to register for this webinar within the hour at 24hournation.com. Um, this has been the 13th 24-Hour Nation webinar since September 2022. You can visit our website at 24hournation.com and follow us on social media to discover more about the people, programs, and possibilities in cities at night. My name is Randall White. Thank you very much. Ladies, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.